Happy Sabbath once more, Campbell. And it's uh, really so good to see you again. And uh, but we drove here through uh, through Mosley, and it's just nice to see some of the old sites. And good to see that you've still got faulty houses here. Yeah? There's some unique things about Birmingham, don't lose them. Uh, some bits of Birmingham are literally falling down. You know, I went to Aston University, that was where I first went in the early 90s, and all the places where I lived at, at the university, they've all been demolished. So uh, Birmingham's a, a city in transition. But um, despite that, some things remain the same. Brother Elaine. <laughs> Brother Elaine, you do not know this, but you had an influence, an impact in my life. Uh, not to embarrass him, but um, before I met Brother Elaine, I would have never considered wearing a purple tie. <laughs> and then one day, he came and he gave me two purple ties, which I still have, and I still wear. So, these are the joys of ministry. But uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be with you. Uh, <clears throat> I have some good news for you today, and it's that I'm in a good mood. Amen. And I'll tell you why. It's because I serve a good God. I serve a good God. He is gracious to me. He is generous to me. I have no reason not to be in a good mood. I am in such a good mood that I just want to praise him and adore him. I am in a good mood because we've just heard the gospel through song, haven't we? Through Brother Moore's song. But did you know that God is so generous that he doesn't just give us one gospel, he gives us two gospels. Two gospels, you ask? I thought there was just a simple, plain gospel, and yes, there is. But the gospel can have nuances, to the extent that, as you walk the streets of New Street, as you walk the streets of Birmingham, and you encounter people of every different size, shape, hue, stature, that as you encounter people and you find that each one is different, because that's the way England is now, isn't it? That when you're meeting with them and when you're sharing with them, you can have one gospel in one pocket and one gospel in another, so that as you talk to them and you listen to where they are in their lives, you can either pull out one gospel or you can pull out the other. God has given us all we need to be effective witnesses. Two gospels. Where would I get such a crazy idea from? I would get it from Paul's letter to the Galatians. Have you got your Bibles with you? Galatians, I've got most of the texts up on the screen, but it really helps. Because you don't know whether I'm tricking you this morning, do you? Okay, I come from a fairly trustworthy family, but who knows? Yeah, so if you've got your Bibles, follow along with me. And uh, in Galatians chapter 2, Paul writes these words. And I'm not going to explain everything about these words, but I just want to highlight that there are two Gospels implied in what Paul writes. Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 to 8, we read this. On the contrary, when we saw that I had been entrusted with the Gospel for the uncircumcised, who are the uncircumcised? Gentiles. Most of us here are Gentiles, aren't we? Yeah? We're all Gentiles, as far as I know. Yeah? So Paul... He writes that I, Paul speaking, had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel, it's implied in the Greek, for the circumcised. So, effectively, we have two gospels here. Yeah, we have a gospel in one pocket for the who? For the uncircumcised. But in my other pocket, I can take out, when I meet a circumcised person, a Jew usually, I can pull out my gospel for the Jews. A gospel for the Gentiles and a gospel for the Jews. I serve a generous God who cares about all people groups in order to tailor salvation for their own experience. He is a good God. This morning I would like to start by giving you Paul's big view of history. See, most of us when we think of our lives, we find it hard enough to make sense of our own lives, let alone to make sense of history. Isn't that right? We find it hard just coping day by day, month by month. But Paul, incredibly, and I can only 
say that he does this through inspiration. He steps back and he doesn't just look at his own life and he knows what that's about, read chapter 1 of Galatians. But he steps back and he gives us a big view of history. And he comes to the conclusion that what God has done in his life and is doing in the world today is not by chance. But God is a God who has planned ahead some 2,000, 3,000 years ago. I am not here this morning by chance, but I'm here because God has brought me here. And because many, many years ago, God made a decision that he was going to do something wonderful. This is the big perspective, the big story within we which, in which we live our lives. And after we've looked at the big picture, then we will consider, well, what is the gospel for the Jews and what is the gospel for the Gentiles? And uh, why I'm interested in this, because as a good Seventh-day Adventist, I suspect that we spend most of our time preaching a gospel that is more suited for Jews than for Gentiles. Hmm. This is why I think it's worth being prepared to know both Paul's gospel and Peter's gospel. The gospel for the uncircumcised and the gospel for the cir circumcised. So here is the big view, the big view of history. And we find this in Galatians 3. In Galatians 3, now, if we read through Galatians, it is tailored according to Greek Roman rhetorical practices, and that means that he actually jumps about. So if you don't mind, I'm actually going to take you through one verse and then another, and then maybe back to one, simply to put the events that Paul describes that have occurred through history, to put them into their chronological order. And then we will move on to what these Gospels mean in practice. And it all starts with Abraham. We have it just chopped off there a little. Abraham, the promised blessing to Abraham. And we read this in Galatians chapter 3. Turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians 3, verses 8 and 9. Galatians 3, verse 8 and 9. And this is what we read. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the Gentiles, all the ethne, all the nations shall be blessed in you. For this reason, those who believe are blessed with Abraham, who believed. This is the promise given to Abraham. Abraham, who lived three and a half thousand years ago plus, God made a promise to him, and he said, my vision is, is that through your seed, through your family, who's going to be blessed? All nations are going to be blessed. This is a God who plans ahead. When I stand before you, it's because 3,000 years ago plus, God had a plan, and I am the result of it. Well, you don't know, but I'm an incredibly special person. Did you know that? You should be amazed with me. Yes. I am the result of 3,500 years of planning. That's me. The next phase in salvation is where Paul turns to Moses and the giving of the law. 430 years after God made his promise to Abraham, he gave his law through Moses. And we find this in Galatians 17, and uh, chapter 3, verse 17, and chapter 3, verse 19. Turning to verse 17, we read this. My point is this. The law which came 430 years later, how many years? 430, that's a long period, isn't it? Between Abraham and Moses, 430 years later, this law which was given does not annul or make, in effect, a covenant, that's the promise to Abraham, previously ratified by God, so as to nullify the promise. So, does the law take precedence of the promise? No. Now this may seem strange to hear, but it is true. There is something more important than the law of God, and do you know what that is? The promise of God. The promise that he gave to Abraham, how many years? 430 years before he gave the law. And he says that the law does not nullify, does not overturn, 
does not do away with, with the promise that he made. And what was the promise? To bless all nations through his seed. So that raises the question, well, why did God give the law? And we read Paul's answer to this question. He, in fact, raises this question in verse 19. He writes, why then the law? Good question. Why then the law? It was added because of transgression. Until the offspring would come through whom the promise had been made. And it was ordained through the angels by a mediator. Why was the law given? Because of transgression. transgression. You know, on the news this week, they uh, reported about uh, uh, this, uh, this young kid who got killed up in Northamptonshire by an American pit bull terrier. Did you see that? No? Uh, this, uh, this dog, savaged. It was actually the, the granny's dog, savage the little granddaughter and killed the, this little girl. Yeah. And uh, as I read the report, they mentioned that in a way it was the granny's fault. Why? Because back in the 1990s, the early 1990s, a number of incidents just like this occurred. People owned pit bulls. Now why do you own a pit bull? Yeah, it's because you've got a crisis of your ego, haven't you? Yeah. That's why you need a pit bull. They had pit bulls, pit bulls, savage kids, they killed them. And so, because of this negative events, how did the government respond? They brought in law. And that law, 1991, was called the Dangerous Dogs Act. Now I'm safe, you know, we actually have a little Yorkie Terrier. Yeah? A little Yorkshire Terrier. Yeah. We use them for evangelism. Yes. He's the friendliest thing you can find. But there's no reason to bring in a dangerous dog act for little Charlie, my Yorkie. He's as sweet as you can imagine. Half his teeth have fallen out. The worst you're going to get from him is a nasty suck. But for dangerous dogs, when something goes wrong, what is, I mean, this is what we do in, in England and the Western world, when something's wrong, we assume if only we can bring in a law. Isn't that right? Bring in a law and make it illegal. So when God gave his law, when he said, thou shalt not commit adultery to the Israelites, why did he have to tell them that? Because they were sitting at home or coming to Camp Hill's needlework club? Thou shalt not steal. What were they doing? Stealing. Law is given in response to transgression. Now, if you are a bit of a theologian at this point, you scratch your head and you say, well, Paul, uh, what makes a, tran a, a transgression if the law was given and there's something that's already wrong? Well, there is a moral law before Moses was given the, the law. So there is a substructure, an ethical moral law that undergirds this universe. But this is how Paul tells the story. The promise was given to Abraham 430 years later. We have God responding to the fact that the Israelites weren't living as they should. And so he had to respond by bringing in law. Unfortunately, it would have been better if they didn't need, hadn't needed that law. If they had been behaving themselves. But because of transgression, he brought in the law. But this law... It has a sting in the tail. If we go back to chapter 3, verse 10, we find that you may start keeping this law and it might provide a pattern for how to live, but there is a sting in the tail with the law. Chapter 3, verse 10, we read, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the things written in the book of the law. How much of the law do you have to keep in order to be okay? All of it. All of it. Have you read through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy? Whoa. And you've got to keep how much of it? All of it. And if you just break one little law, yeah, you wear the wrong type of clothing with another piece of cloth. 
What happens to you? You run into a curse. But there's some good news. The good news is verse 13. Verse 13, we read this. But Christ redeemed us from what? The curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, and now Paul actually quotes from the law itself. He quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23. He quotes there, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that, and let's come to that in a moment. So what has Jesus done? By being hung on a tree, he has become cursed, and he's taken the curse, which is by rights those who did not keep the law. Are you with me today? Yes. But how did that verse end? In order that. God died in order that. Now what do, you, do those words mean? In order that. I do this in order that something else may happen. Isn't that so? I do X, Y, Z in order that this is my real goal. Which came first, the law of the promise? The promise. The law does not overturn the promise. And so the in order of that comes in the very next verse. Verse 14 of chapter 3. Galatians 3 verse 14. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Wasn't that the promise? That all nations would be blessed through Abraham. So that we might receive the promise of and what is that promise? The promise of the Spirit through faith. Do you know the goal of salvation history according to Galatians is that we receive the Holy Spirit? Did you know that? The goal of salvation, you read Galatians. Galatians is not about how to get you out of it. That's not the goal of Galatians. Galatians is not about how to get you out of Birmingham and into heaven. That's not the goal of Galatians. Galatians says that there is actually something wonderful happening in the here and now. That God has a plan which doesn't just take us to heaven, but actually blesses us in the present. In the present. And that is that we receive his Holy Spirit today. This is the goal of salvation in history. The reception of the Holy Spirit. The ancient world is very different from our world. But let me share with something that I was very disturbed when I heard this. It's uh, one of my wife, my wife's from Ethiopia. And one of her Ethiopian friends, I mean it's tragic when I tell you this, but uh, one of her children, young boy, 13 years old, lives up in Manchester, Goes along to school and he is bullied. Tragic. Do you know why? Because he has an iPhone 3. An iPhone 3. <coughs> now I have a Sony. I have a Sony. And a Sony, you know, okay, I'm a bit ashamed of it myself. Yeah. But an iPhone 3? I mean, what are we on now? iPhone 4? iPhone 5? iPhone 6? The poor guy, what type of parents would dare to send their child to school with an iPhone 3? You're just asking for trouble, aren't you? You're asking for trouble. Yeah. Why? Because in our world, which is best? Old or new? New. We want, I mean, we've got an iPhone 6 and we think, oh no, because in a couple of months this is going to be out of we always want the newest. We want to hear the latest. And those in Paul's day who were coming along to the Gentile believers and saying, to be a proper member of God's people, you need to be circumcised, gentlemen, cross your legs, feel uncomfortable. You need to be circumcised. Why? Because the law of Moses says it. What does Paul say? He says, no. Before Moses came along, who was there? Abraham. You see, in the ancient world, it's not iPhone 3 or an iPhone 6. That's not the issue. In the ancient world, the older something was the better. Because if it's old and we still know about it today, obviously it's worth 
mentioning, maintaining, remembering, abiding by. The older something was, the better in the ancient world. And so for those who are coming along and say, hey, you've got to keep the law of Moses, what does Paul say? Before Moses there was Abraham. And I'm not going to go into this, but just to, if you want to have a, a, an avenue to explore, when you come to Romans, Romans, Paul takes you back even before Abraham. What's the great Old Testament character that he takes you back to in Romans before Abraham? Begins with A. Adam. Throughout Paul's ministry, he's going back as far as he can, right back to beyond Moses, to Abraham, beyond Abraham, to Adam. But that's another sermon in itself. So this is his big scheme of history. And how does it relate to the gospel for the Jews and the gospel for the Gentiles? Let me take you to Galatians 4. For here we have, and I've put them in red and white. White is sort of how he explains the Gentile experience of salvation, and red, this is my own interpretation, is how he explains the Jewish experience. Chapter 4, verse 3, so with us, while we were minors, we were enslaved to what? To the elemental spirits of the world. That, that little term, elemental spirits, is a very hard word to translate. Now, in some of your translations, you may have great variety when you compare translations. The Greek word is stoikeia. It literally means the, the, the rules, the regulations that guide the universe. But by the time Paul writes, he, this term was applied for all the gods that ruled the ancient world. You know, the ancient world was full of gods. You know that? You know, at Newbold, we teach good research practices. You know, the first place to go is Wikipedia. Just type in Wikipedia, Greek and Roman gods, and you will see a list of about 600 gods. 600 gods. They had gods for the plough. They had gods for the bean seed, for the wheat. They had gods for everything you can imagine, for every mood you could experience. They had a god. A god for happiness, a god for love, a god for anger, a god for jealousy. And every time you got up in the morning, you had to consult who? Different gods. You lived under these gods. That is the Gentile experience. But in verse 4, he turns to the Jewish experience. But when the fullness of time had come, he writes in chapter 4, verse 4, God sent his son, born of a woman. What does he mean by that? Come through humanity. He became, took on upon himself humanity. Born under the law. What does that mean? He became a Jew, one under the law. Wouldn't you agree, first century, who was under the law? The Jews. He became a Jew, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem, to save those who are under the law. Huh. Who did I say is under the law? Jews or Gentiles? Jews. They received the law, the law of Moses. So technically, according to Galatians, technically, now I don't want you to go and rewrite all the, the hymns in the songbook, okay? But according to Galatians, for whom did Jesus die? Jew or Gentile? It was for the Jews. He came under the law to die for those under the law. He became cursed to die for them. Now, you know, I couldn't leave you in suspense, because when you come to Romans, what he says is that there's not just a written law, but there is a law that comes into our hearts, the, the law of our conscience, which even Gentiles have. So when you come to Romans, all have some form of law, and all of us have broken it in some way, and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. So Jesus, his death in Romans is for all of us. But when we read Galatians, he maintains this subtle distinction. Jesus came born of a woman, born under the law in order to redeem those who are under the law. 
so that. So here we have the Jewish gospel, the gospel of the Jews. Jesus dies to deal with the curse of those who are under the law. And when I think about our outreach as Adventists, so often we assume a certain knowledge. But that knowledge is slowly dying in the world that we live. We define sin as what? Transgression of the law. But what happens when you're working with people and they don't know the law? We preached, Babylon, Babylon is fallen. Come out of her, my people. That is what we have preached for 150 years. And in 19, 18th century, 19th century America, we preached that Babylon was what? Fallen Protestantism. But what happens when you're walking through the streets of Birmingham? How many Protestants do you meet? My suggestion is this, is that when somebody is drowning, you don't have time to teach them to swim. You have to drag, save them while they are drowning. Later, teach them to swim. And so we come to the gospel for the Gentiles. And this is talking about a very different experience. So that, that's how verse 4 ended. Galatians 4. So that we... And now he's looking at Gentiles, might receive adoption as children. And let me just press the pause button there. This is such an important concept. Adoption. Adoption. In our Western world, how are you thinking? When we think of adoption, sadly, often we think that to be adopted, an adopted child of someone has a lesser status than the biological children. Often that's thought by some people. But you know, in the ancient world, it never was that way. You've heard of Julius Caesar, haven't you? Julius Caesar. He uh, set himself up as the dictator of Rome, overthrew the Roman Republic, and uh, following Roman practices, yeah, he came to the conclusion that in order to ensure a smooth transition of power to somebody who was going to be competent to run the empire, he had to adopt somebody as his child, as his son. And that's what he did. He adopted his nephew, great nephew, Octavian, adopted him as his son. And Octavian became emperor, took on the name Augustus, and you read in Luke, Jesus was born under which emperor? And emperor? under Caesar Augustus. He was the adopted son of Julius Caesar. Because in the ancient world, I mean, we are crazy. Yeah? We think that when we die, what do we do with our house and our car and our dogs and cats? We just assume we give them to our children. But what happens if your child is a good for nothing? Have you thought of that? Now, thankfully, in Camp Hill, none of you have that problem. But in the ancient world, it was crazy just to give away your life's work to someone simply because they happen to be biologically related to you. No. Let your children grow up. This was the practice. Observe them. See whether they deserve that. That's the way it went. And so the ancients didn't leave inheritance to chance. If their children didn't turn out well, they would adopt a child of whom they could be proud of. And so here when Paul says that we might receive, we being Gentiles might receive adoption, does that mean we are second class citizens in the kingdom of God? Absolutely not. This is saying we are the children that God planned. He looked at us and said, yes, these are the sons and daughters who will make us. We are the apple of his eye. So that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. This is my experience. When you get up in the morning and you've just got this yearning to speak to your father, this is the Holy Spirit telling you 
This is the Gentile experience. This is my experience. I just want to talk to my Lord saints. And so he continues describing the Gentile experience, verse 7. So you are no longer a slave but a child, and if a child then also an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were entrusted to beings that by nature are not gods. Before, you were under the power of beings that are what? By nature, not gods. Who is Paul talking about there? He is talking about, today, what we would call demons. In the ancient world, they had names. Apollo, Zeus, all these names. This plethora of gods. Those were the gods that you lived under. Formerly when you did not know God. That sounds more like the Gentile experience than the Jewish experience, doesn't it? You were enslaved to those that are by nature not gods. Verse 9, we read. Now, however, that you have become known, come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and beggarly elemental spirits? How can you turn back to those spirits? This is the crisis Paul is facing in Galatians. That the believers are going to be circumcised and he equates going back to being under the law as going back to being under these beggarly and elemental spirits. This is the experience of the Gentiles their experience is not that they have broken the law. They don't know the law. Their experience instead is that they have been oppressed by demonic active beings which claim to be gods but in reality are not gods. This is a reality which we face today. Have you been into W.H. Smith's recently? Gone to the children's section? I mean, I only go in once a year when we're coming up to Christmas because that's our boys, uh, it's what they get for Christmas, a book from W.H. Smith's. Yeah. And so you go into W.H. Smith's, you have a look, and do you know these days it's hard to find a book that you can buy as a Christian? A children's book. They are all involving the occult, witchcraft, witches this and witches that. It's pervading our culture. If we think that by living in a secular country, that the gospel to the Gentiles released from demonic oppression is something of the past, open your eyes. It's all around. It's in our music. It's infested our films. It's in our literature. When we go on holiday, we go to France, to the same place each year. And our neighbour on one side, she's an old Catholic lady. And when I visit her, which gospel do I share? The gospel of the Jews or the gospel for the Gentiles? I share the gospel for the Jews. But you know our neighbours on the other side? It's a young couple, they're in their forties. That's still young saints. <laughs> when I visit, when we visit them, like this French couple, they've got five children. They're sort of feral children, they run wild. But the, uh, we've got to know them over the years. Because holiday is more than just resting. You know what the primary purpose of holiday is? It's to take you out of your comfort zone so you can find somebody that God wants you to get for. That's the primary purpose of a holiday. Yeah. And so don't just view your holidays as time for yourself. It's an opportunity for God to use us. So we're visiting this couple, and over the years, they've started to open up and share their, their lives with us. And we found that they are Buddhists. They've reacted strongly against what they perceive to be the, uh, the, the downsides of Roman Catholicism. And this summer, as we, we were spending one day with them, and uh, we were having our hot drinks together, and the lady was explaining how she does meditation. And she says, when I do meditation, my primary purpose is to free myself from the demons. Cool. When I heard that, my jaw dropped. This is 21st century, you know that? 21st century. She is trying to free herself from <coughs> demons. Which gospel do I share with her? 
The gospel for the Jews or the gospel for the Gentiles? The gospel for the Gentiles is a message that you who were once under elemental spirits can now receive a more powerful, liberating spirit. The spirit of Jesus, the spirit who breaks bondage and brings freedom, freedom, true freedom. This is the gospel to the Gentiles. Let me share another experience. When I was working as a pastor, I had one of the members contact me. My grandchild, my granddaughter is in trouble. She didn't come to church. So I went to visit her. And it turned out that when she, she was early 20s, she was working part-time, she was studying at college. And when she went to bed at night, she had this being who would appear at the bottom of her bed and try to talk to her. And this freaked her out. And when she went to work, as she would be walking around her office where she worked with her colleagues, you know these yellow highlighter pens? <laughs> highlighter pens would literally float around behind her. Literally float around. Follow her around. This was demonic activity in her life. <coughs> and so I asked her, well, who were your friends? What's going on in your life? It turned out that her best friend was an Australian. Now that in itself is nothing to worry about. But she was a new age priestess, her friend. And she had given this young lady a load of new age trinkets, whatever. And so what we had to do, we had to clean her house from top to bottom to take anything out of her house that Satan could come along and say, that is an invitation card for me to dwell in your house. That's what we had to do. We had to do a spring clean like she had never done before. And the disturbances, they ended. But the sad thing is this. You remember Jesus told a parable about a house that was cleaned up from an evil spirit. But then if you don't invite a good spirit to dwell in that house, the evil spirit who's been cast out will go out into the wilderness and find friends and come back and invite them in and you will end up in a worse situation. You know the parable, don't you? And this is what happened to that girl. It's one thing to want to live your life and to live it free from oppression and to try and maintain some form of freedom. But freedom comes when you have a house full of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All other forms of freedom are just counterfeits. What does Paul describe them as? He says they are weak. What does weak mean? It means when you're in trouble, they can't help you. Beggarly. When you don't have enough things, they can't bless you. Weak and beggarly spirits, elemental spirits. That is your previous experience, Paul is saying. But now you have received the Holy Spirit. Do you know, I realise that as I read Galatians, I have been reading it as a cool, calculated, rational Western. That he's actually dealing with a world which is creeping up behind me, and I don't even realize it. Go back to chapter 3. Chapter 3. This is my last verse for today. Chapter 3. He writes, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has done what? Bewitched you. Who has bewitched you? This is the only time in the New Testament we come across this word. I did some research on this word as to how it's used in, in Greek literature. And this word, now you can, I can give you the sources, but I found sources where they're describing debates as to how the curse, you know the evil eye, you've heard of this? How the evil eye is transmitted? This is the word for it. That you have been, Paul is saying to the Galatians, the believers, he's saying, somebody who has done what? Bewitched you. Who's put you under a curse? Through the evil eye. And it, does, it wasn't just through sight, it could be through touch, it could be through smell. This is how the Greeks believed that this could occur. And he's saying, who's put you under this curse? The incredible thing is, is that 
He believes that by sharing this revelation of Galatians that he can break the curse. Never underestimate the power of God's word. Amen. Never underestimate the power to transform people and to break the stranglehold of Satan upon people's lives. It was, Paul says, before your eyes. Maybe they believed they had been cursed. Somebody had looked at them, put the curse on them. It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly, some translations will have portrayed. The same word can literally mean, you've seen people going around the streets where they have boards with writing written, you know, plac placards. He's saying it was before your very eyes that Jesus Christ was portrayed or publicly placarded as crucified. And maybe Paul is suggesting that somehow through the proclamation, in the way that he did it, it can it broke first time the power of these elemental spirits, beggarly, poor, weak elemental spirits. The good news I have this morning, saints, is this: is that God has given us not just one gospel for those who already know a lot, but He's given us a gospel for the Gentiles, for those who are experiencing the power of Satan at work in their lives. He has made this plan 3,000 years ago, plus, to Abraham, that one day he would bless all nations and give them a spirit. And if you think that this is just for those who are experiencing demonic oppression in their lives today, stop and think about the gods who oppress people in our neighbourhoods. Men are chasing their tails, addicted to money, sex and power. Money, sex and power seems to drive so many people today. And the ancients, they simply said, well, money, sex and power, we have three gods, Plutus, Riches, money. Aphrodite, the god of sex. And Kratos, the god of power. Wouldn't you agree that today people are under these gods? And they need a liberating, freedom bringing god, a spirit today. You may not know this, but Kratos has a brother. His name is Nike. Yeah, many people are advertising free of charge when they play basketball. These are gods, which are unfortunately alive and well in our society. But the good news is, is that we can go forth with courage, with conviction, because we know that we have a gospel to who? The Jews, and a gospel for the Gentiles. That we have a message of freedom, that they can experience the liberation that comes by faith when they receive God's mighty spirit in their lives. If you haven't invited them into your life, I invite him. I invite you to invite him in. And you will find that when he comes in, he doesn't just liberate you from demons, elements and spirits. But you read on in Galatians 5, he starts to liberate you from the hardest bondage that we have. And do you know what that is? To ourselves. From the fruits of the flesh. May God work his miracles in our lives and bless you as a church. Come and